All right, welcome everyone to day 30 of DA with DA and DC. DC. So it's day 30 of the DA with DA challenge. We've got people showing up already. They're so fast. They're, they're amazingly fast. Look at that number. We'll just keep going up, 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 up. How on earth? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. amazing. They know. Wow. They know because I let them know an hour ago that we were coming on. I see. Um, welcome, everyone. We are so glad that you're able to join us. We are here in beautiful, sunny, rural Pennsylvania. Where am I? Hamburg, Pennsylvania. Okay, people were asking yesterday where in Pennsylvania I am. I'm in Hamburg. Hamburg. Yeah, like hamburger, but spelled different. Okay. Like, spelled like Germany. Okay. I'm in Hamburg, Pennsylvania with my good friend D. Casper, and I spent the morning teaching some of the students, well, all of the students yeah. from the school that D runs here. D, just take a moment to tell us about CORE. Sure. Because people might not know what it is. Yeah, so CORE, it's a nine-month uh, discipleship and evangelism training program. So kind of giving young people an opportunity to own their faith, find their calling, and to be empowered to change the world around them. So they do Bible work, canvassing, health evangelism, agriculture. There's a heavy emphasis on mental health uh, mm. throughout the program and oh, like overseas that. missions. So it's kind of a holistic, longer term. Oh, overseas mission missions. Program. Yeah. Where do you go? Uh, two years ago, we went to Cuba. This year, we're going to go to Houston and minister to refugees just because of COVID stuff. But oh, hopefully, gotcha. we can go back to Cuba next year. That's yeah, that's right. I remember you went to Cuba. Yeah. Was that awesome? It was amazing. That's so cool. It was so amazing. And yeah. D, this is now the second year that CORE has yes. run a full program? Yeah. Okay. It's going good. It's going great. Yeah. So coreevangelism.com. And D is the director, founder. Yeah. Yeah, director, yeah. Creator. Teacher. Chief cook and bottle washer. Accountant. <laughs> All of it. So D has yeah. asked me to come out here to CORE to spend some time, three days, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, talking to the students here about apologetics. Mm -hmm. And man, I had a great time this morning. You've got a great class. Yeah, it was great. Really was good amazing. kids. And uh, some of them aren't even kids. Some, they're adults, really, yeah. is what they are. Yeah, post-high school age. Yeah, but... 18 to 35-ish age range. Yeah, yeah, that's sort of the typical Arise student. Is probably the average Arise student sort of 23 to 28. Yeah. But then we get people that are younger than that. In fact, we've been having a lot of teenagers mm. lately, which is really great, in Australia. Yeah. So welcome, everybody. So glad you're here. Let's just say hi to some people. Hello, Maxine and S-Pop. S-Pop V joining us from Texas. We won't mess with you, S Pop V, because you don't mess with Texas. <laughs> um, let's see, who else do we have here? Those Cooks, Jen, hi. And a wave from LA Sonrix, hello. Hey, Deb Murray says, Blue Mountain Academy. That's right. We are literally looking out our window right now at Blue Mountain Academy, That's and true. it is beautiful. Yeah. Hello, Maxine, hello, Loretta. Hello, Pam Palmer. Hey. Great to see you, Pam. Uh, Scott Webb. Janet? Esther Janet, is that right? Zori, what's well, going fast now? Oh, from Finland. Greetings from Finland. That's Brady, right, yeah. Patrice, Sonia, Sharon, Hannah. Great to see you, Hannah. City Love HG is Hannah Griffith, but now she's Hannah Suarez. I married her. Oh, okay. She needs to change her Instagram. I thought you were married already. Yeah, I, I, I married her and Johnny. Oh, okay. Uh, Kelly, That's a good call. Amber, B. Holdel, Rich77. Oh, you're only 40 minutes away. Deb, you should be sitting right here. <laughs> you should be sitting right here. I mean, there's not a lot of room for us, That's but true. there's room for a head right here. You could be <laughs> right there. Okay, welcome everybody. We are so glad that you are here for day Saint three. Lucia. Ooh, St. Lucia. Day three zero of DA with DA. We are in the book we're reading through in 90 days, the classic on the life of Christ by Ellen White called The Desire of Ages. The Desire of Ages, as you might be aware, is a reference to the Old Testament minor prophet Haggai, who in chapter two referred to the coming Messiah as the desire of all nations. Mm -hmm. And so the idea here is that Jesus would show up and he would be just what everybody was hoping for, looking for, longing for. And the picture that we have seen, that I have seen in Jesus so far of the Desire of Ages is that he's all of that and more that there's an infinity beyond. Yes. And today's chapter is a really great one. In fact, I don't know if you knew this or not, D, there are 87 chapters in the English version of The Desire of Ages. Today we're in chapter 29, which means we are exactly one third of the way through. Because 87 divided by three is 29. 
So if, if you have a look here, it's absolutely amazing. It feels like we just started a few days ago and one third of the book is behind us. By the way, speaking of being behind us, <laughs> there's a very large, is that a chocolate lab? Yeah. A very large chocolate lab that would love to be here as he a part of DA with DA. Maybe he loves get... all of you already. <laughs> Maybe at the end we'll introduce you to yeah. Buddy. Um, but right now we're just, we have him in his little kennel because if, if he was here, he would steal the show. He would. He would steal the show. I mean, technically he already has. Yeah, exactly. About. So if you hear some noise in the background, we're not, nobody's tied up in the corner. We're not being invaded. No, no, it's just a dog. Um, so just a couple more quick announcements. This is live right now on Instagram. Welcome everybody from Instagram. It will be archived, of course, there, and then it will be later also on my YouTube channel. Um, people asking if I've heard anything from Facebook yet, still no. I haven't checked my email yet today, but I'll do that in a bit. Still no word from them. I mean, we're getting down precariously close to the place where they're just gonna close down my account. I don't know why I'm supposedly in violation of their community standards. No idea what that's a reference to. So I think I've probably still got a few more days, maybe as much as a week left before they just cancel me. Wow. So maybe join me, continue to join me in prayer that that doesn't happen. Cause I've got like 35,000 followers on Facebook and it took a lot of years to get those people built up and it would be really sad if all of a sudden I couldn't talk to them. Hmm. Um, Because a lot of people are just on Facebook. You have the people that sort of do Instagram and the people that do Twitter and then you have people that are like, no, diehard Facebook. Yeah. So hopefully that'll all work out. YouTube hopefully is that catch all though. Yeah, yeah, YouTube has been really good but it's been hard to kind of get the word out a little bit. Yeah, the subscribers are up. If If you're watching on YouTube, uh, subscribe, like, hit the bell. Okay. And um, right now, the YouTube channel is just entirely the DA with DA challenge, but we've got some big plans coming up, and uh, I'll be telling you a lot more about that in the future. Originally, the plan was not to launch the YouTube channel with DA with DA, but when Facebook went down, my good friend Daryl just created a YouTube channel for me, just spent two full days over the course of a weekend and built it and called me up and said, you now have a YouTube channel, use it. And so, um, anyway, we've got some really big plans and ideas for the YouTube channel. We've got some great things coming up this coming week, but without any further ado, let's get into today's chapter. And you were on a plane yesterday. You flew from Colorado yesterday too. I flew later, yeah. Both of us flew from Denver to Philadelphia and, and yesterday. both of us had a unique sidetrack and got here way later than we should have. Oh, yeah. very quickly, very quickly. D. Oh, what happened to you yesterday? I don't want to admit this publicly. Admit I, this publicly. It's going to be good for your good for your pride. I landed at like 11 p.m. and I could not find my car in the parking garage. Philadelphia has like <laughs> six parking garages, and I checked all of B, all of C, and I, for 45 minutes when I was pushing my clicker for my car keys, I literally heard nothing. I was praying. <laughs> I was crying on the inside. It's midnight now. I want to go home, and I'm an hour and a half from home. And finally, when I get to the C, to the, to C, when I push the thing, I hear a sound. I hear my car honking, and I'm thinking it's in D and have no idea why it's in D, but I'm tired of, I'm just going to go find it. So I go to D, and I can't find it, and I go to the edge of D looking towards C, and I push it again, and it's on C. Where I had looked, and I see it, and it's on the fourth floor, so I go to the fourth floor. How did floor. you miss it? I have no idea. I don't know. So how long from the time that you started looking for your car until you found it? At least an hour. I think it was like an hour and 15 minutes. I didn't get home till 2 a.m. Has anyone else out there done this? I mean, not like misplaced your car I for lost my a car. minute or two. Has anyone out there misplaced their car for more than an hour? I wondered if it was stolen, if it was towed. Like, I didn't know, do I get a hotel? Do I rent a car? But I own a car, I live here. I didn't know you could have called me to come and pick you up, but I it was like asleep. midnight. Yeah. And it would take me three hours to get there. Yeah. Because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so D flew from Colorado yesterday. I flew from Colorado yesterday. Now we're both in Pennsylvania. And yesterday's chapter on the call of Levi Matthew, we went for two hours. That was our record. And today's chapter on the Sabbath, we've been talking about how we knew this chapter was coming. Today's chapter is such a beautiful, sequential yeah. follow-up to yesterday's chapter. It just makes so much sense. And as I mentioned yesterday, if you're ever wrestling with someone who's new to Ellen White or hostile to Ellen White or just very skeptical, which by the way, it's okay to be skeptical. We should be skeptical about people that 
have sort of inspiration kind of claims. We should be absolutely skeptical. They should be tested. They should be evaluated. And if you have someone like that in your experience, in your life, in your community, I cannot think of a better chapter, just a better short thing for them to read than yesterday's chapter because there was so much goodness, so much fire, so much beauty, and that many of the things, and she does this again and again, and I'll show you two examples of it today, many of the sort of seeds that she's planted yesterday, journal entry from yesterday, yep, Laura, uh, no, you said you were gonna say that last night in the video. The journal entry, what did I say I was gonna say? You said you could show your journal entry from that morning. Oh, yeah. Laura, I'm so glad you reminded me of that, and I didn't prepare it, and so I'll do it tomorrow. What I have to do is, the reason that it's complicated is it's, the journal is actually on my phone, and so if I pick up my phone, well, and I go to the, I use a, a, an app called One Day, then anyway, I'm so sorry, Laura, I forgot that. I will read it tomorrow. But anyway, what, what she's referencing here is that I made a journal entry yesterday about the way that God moved my heart in reading and studying through yesterday's chapter. And I just thought, oh, I'll just read that to the people. And so I apologize, Laura, I forgot that. I will remember it tomorrow. But as I was saying, the, Ellen White, there's a, this is a pattern in her writing, at least in Desire of Ages, and I've noticed it in other works as well, where she'll say something in one chapter and then she'll, there'll be little strings, little threads, and she'll pull some of those threads into the next chapter, pull them into the next chapter. And so you have this, not only the obvious continuity of the narrative of the life of Jesus as described in the gospels, but themes, little thematic elements. And I'm gonna give you at least two, maybe three examples of that today. But as I was reading this chapter, I thought this is the perfect follow-on, mm -hmm. the perfect sequel to yeah. what we discussed yesterday in the call of Levi Matthew. Um, so we're gonna be talking about the Sabbath. That is our chapter title today. So we're in chapter 29, the Sabbath. Let me see, there it is. So welcome Instagram, welcome YouTube. We're gonna start with prayer. And Dee, why don't you have opening prayer for us? You don't mind? Sure. You bet. Sweet Jesus, thank you for the privilege to study together. Uh, thank you for what a gift the book Desire of Ages has been mm. in improving our view of Jesus. Yeah, that's and right. And of your intention for religion at large. And uh, she's going in on that today. Yeah. We went on that yesterday. I just pray that you would help us to see your clear picture of what you intended faith movements to be, yeah. and particularly the Sabbath, which is something that is largely misunderstood even by those who cherish it. So God help us and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you, Dee. I'm gonna grab my Bible. So today's uh, chapter is, if you look, not based on any, it doesn't say, you know, based on so-and-so, so-and-so, but it's actually built on a series of stories from Mark 2, Mark 3, Matthew 12, Luke 6. I think that's all of them. And it revolves really around two primary stories. One is the healing of a man with a withered hand, and the other is the uh, accusation by the religious leaders of Jesus' disciples that they were breaking the Sabbath when they were walking through a field and they ate some of the grain. And so I'm, I'm not gonna read those here because we'll encounter them in the yeah. story, but it's Mark 2, Mark 3, Luke 6, Matthew 12. And like a very like parenthetical reference to John 5 where we've already covered. Yeah, the John, with the, the healing at the pool of Bethesda, yeah. which was also on Sabbath. Okay, yeah. so once again, Jesus is purposefully and provocatively choosing, strategically choosing to perform many of his highest profile miracles on the Sabbath. This is with intention. We're gonna encounter this again later in Luke 13. And here, Ellen White's gonna go in and explain to us why. Mm -hmm. Why Jesus did that. Because Jesus, as the creator, and therefore as the creator of the Sabbath, is trying to rescue the Sabbath from the trappings and from the barricades that had been surrounding it by religionists. And this is great. I, yeah. We're gonna have so much fun. Yeah. So what I wanna do is I wanna start by, we're on page 320 of Types and Symbols and um, 281 of the original. I've got the red. D, what do you got? Monochrome. Look at that, beautiful. Um, so I'm just gonna go through, go through here and read maybe the first, probably the first two or three paragraphs. They're short and it'll just get us heading in the right direction. It says, the Sabbath was hallowed at creation right? Made holy, sanctified, set apart, okay? The Sabbath was hallowed at creation, 
as ordained for mankind. It had its origins when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, quoting Job 38. Peace brooded over the mm. world. And I liked that. Yeah. Did you underline that? I thought that was really a great way to say that. I should have. Peace brooded over the world. For earth was in harmony with heaven. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good, and he rested in the joy of his completed work. Mm. Genesis 131. And I like that the way, let's just stop there. That's the first paragraph. I actually like what she did there. She doesn't just say he rested from his labors. He rested in the joy, his own joy of his created work. That reminds me of what we talked about in the chapter at Capernaum, that Jesus was delighted in the fact that he could relieve suffering. Yes. It, the language kind of alludes to something very similar here, that he rested, he took delight in his ability to do what he did. Yeah, I'm glad because, you reminded me of that. Because this will continue to give healing and joy and liberation to people later. Yeah, that's right. He, it's an institution yeah. that possesses in a special sense, the presence of Jesus. The restorative power. Yeah, I'm so glad you reminded me of that, that Jesus was happy that he had the power that he could bring happiness and health and healing to people. Yeah, yeah great, yeah. great memory. Um, I just love the idea that we have a God that experiences the emotional landscape. Yeah. This is a very important idea. There is a notion in Greek thinking and in some Christian circles about the nature of God, the ontology of God, and a word that is sometimes used to describe God in this particular area is impassable or describing God's impassibility. And when we talk about the impassibility of God, what theologians and philosophers are referencing is not that God cannot be passed like on a freeway or something, but it comes from the word passion, hmm. that he is without emotion. He wow. is, because emotion, listen to the word, motion, to move, to change, hmm. right? By the way, we call movies, right? And we say, oh, that was, it's moving, that the slides are moving, and I, I was moved. We use all this language that communicates that you've changed states. You were sad, now you're happy. This, this idea of emotion communicates change. Mm -hmm. And so the ancient think, thinkers, especially the Greeks, said, whoa, 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 God can't experience emotion because he's perfect being. That's His so ontology is perfect right. being, and so they coined the phrase, he was impassable, not subject to emotion. That's like the most compelling argument on behalf of God is the fact that he's so moved and deeply connected. Yes. It's like one of the Agreed. greatest affronts to the character of Agreed. God. Agreed. Yeah. And there are even a, a great many Christian theologians today that have bought in to the sort of Greek notion mm -hmm. of God's ontology, and they'll say, well... You know, all this stuff in the Bible about God's emotions and God's passion, that's just anthropomorphic language where God's communicating with us, but God doesn't actually himself experience those things. Mm. And it's like, yeah, no, I'm sorry. If we're going to take scripture seriously, we can't import all of these Greek Hellenistic ideas. We just have to take the text at its word. Right. And so I love this idea that he rested in the joy of his created and completed work. When God looked out and saw everything that he had made, it brought him joy. Yeah. He was happy. Absolutely. He was absolutely happy. Okay, second paragraph. Because he had rested upon the Sabbath, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, set it apart to a holy use. He gave it to Adam and Eve, no doubt, as a day of rest. It was a memorial of the work of creation and thus a sign of God's power and yeah. his love. The scripture says he has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The things that are made declare the invisible attributes of God since the creation of the world, even his everlasting power and divinity. She's quoting there from Romans 1, Psalm 111. Um, I heard you say, and it jumped out to me as well, a sign of God's power and, and love. love. Yeah, it's not just that I'm powerful and you're spending a day to acknowledge how powerful I am. Mm. It's a day that's given, it reminds me of Tonstad, you know, that I gave this not as a reminder that you may acknowledge and love me, but to make it clear that I also recognize and love you. Yeah, really in great. In his book, um, The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day. Yeah, which by the way, if you have not read the book by Sigve Tonstad, The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day, it is, it is my... It's probably my favorite book on the Sabbath. It's close because I also absolutely love Abraham Joshua Heschel's The Sabbath. Have you read that yet? Oh, that's incredible. So 
Yeah, this is a really great point that Tonstead makes is that he, he talks about how the Sabbath drives the stake of the divine, divine presence in the, the soil of, of human time. time. Check you that. out. I love that. Woo, isn't that great? The yeah. stake of the divine presence in the soil of human time. Great book, The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day, published by Andrews University Press. Well worth your time, energy, and effort. Yeah. I should call up Dr. Tonstead. I've met him, actually. Say, hey, you need, to, you need to send me a royalty or a t-shirt or something. I've probably sold hundreds or thousands I've, of copies of that book because I tell everybody to yeah, buy it. Same. Great, great book. And I just really like the idea that the Sabbath is a sign, not just that God is powerful enough to create, but that he voluntarily, lovingly chooses to create. Right. To lavish his love upon us. Did yeah. you notice on the very next page, she says that the Sabbath is a token of his love yeah. and power, yeah. she reverses them. Right. I thought that was so interesting. Here she yeah. says it's a sign of God's power and love. The next page she says, it is a token of the love and power of Christ. Mm -hmm. I like that, I like that. God is under no compulsion to create. I've sometimes heard preachers say, and I know what they're driving at. They're trying to get at the fact that God is so good, so kind, so loving, that, that he wants to create, and you'll even hear, God had to create. No, God was not under any external compulsion to create. He didn't have to create in the sense of an absolute imperative. He chose to create for purposes, like parents do, of sharing their love with others. And so I just really like the idea that God created not only out of power, yes, he had the capacity, he created out of love. He wanted to share the inter-Trinitarian dynamic of love and selflessness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with the created world. His crowning act of creation was man, and the first gift he gives to man is the Sabbath. Yes. Um, this idea of complete, unrestricted, uninterrupted, quality face time with their maker. And, and, it's, it, and it's to mm. lay a foundation of speaking their um, intrinsic moral value into them. Correct. Like the very way that I created you and the way that I'm spending time with you in the first day that you have here on this earth. You are valuable. Is, it's setting the foundation of your intrinsic moral value. Yeah. And I think that's, that, that's the angle I take with the Sabbath now more than anything is the fact that it communicates our value. Yeah, a really great way to say that is the Sabbath communicates that we are not God's subjects. We are his sons and daughters. We're the object of his affection. We're his yeah. sons and daughters. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I, yeah. I really like that. What does Paul yeah. say in Galatians? You're no longer servants or slaves. Right. You're sons. Yeah. Right? And so beautiful, very beautiful. We want to, I want to spend time with my children. Mm -hmm. You want to spend time with your chocolate lab. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> okay, uh, let's read that third paragraph now as well. It says, all things were created by the Son of God. And then she quotes John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. And since the Sabbath is a memorial of the work of creation, it is a token of the love and power of Christ. I'm gonna read one more paragraph here. Yes. The Sabbath calls our thoughts to nature. Even as we're sitting here doing this, I don't know if you can hear it, but I can hear just outside. And by the way, spring is well and truly here in Pennsylvania. Right now, I can hear outside chipping sparrows, song sparrows, and cardinals, and they woke me up this morning, and I could not be happy. That's the best alarm clock. Yeah. The birds are going off here in Pennsylvania. They're ready for spring. I mean, it's March 22, and the chipping sparrows, and the song sparrows, and the cardinals this morning, I mean, it's amazing. So listen to this. The Sabbath calls our thoughts to nature and brings us into, the, into communion with the Creator in the song of the bird. The sighing of the trees, I like that. Yeah. The music of the sea, we may still hear his voice who talked with Adam and Eden in the cool of the day. And as we behold his power in nature, I love this. We find comfort. We find comfort. I, like I underline that. I circled it, yeah. For the word that created all things is that which speaks life to the soul. Mm. He who commanded light to shine, one of my favorite passages, he who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. I love this. Yeah. Now, this is, I, I love this too because what she's equating in her language here is the fact that the very way, like we have access to just as precious a level of communion with God through his creation and through the Sabbath that Adam and Eve had face to face. Yeah, that's and She's right. equating that. Like th this is just as accessible and precious and life imparting. It brings comfort and speaks life to the soul in the same way as if he was actually there speaking to No, them. that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I just love the idea as a birder, many of you are probably aware I'm a very keen bird watcher and I've lived in Australia for the last seven years 
And so I am so familiar right now with the sounds of the avian world in Australia, right? So like if an Eastern Whitbird was calling, I'd say, yeah, Eastern Whitbird. Or if I heard a white-eared monarch, I'd say, oh yeah, that's a white-eared monarch. But now that I've come back to America, all of these sounds that I used to know back to front, I'm like, what is that? This morning I was walking around out in your front yard, D, and I was like, what is, a song sparrow. I mean, song sparrow is like one of the most easy, obvious calls. The other day I heard a great little call, cheeseburger, 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 <laughs> cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. That's the Carolina Wren. And it's been so great to come back here and reacquaint myself with all these incredible birds and their songs. And I just love this idea. In the song of the bird, we may still hear his voice. Mm. As I told your students today, one of my favorite things about being a birder is I just feel like I'm in continual contact, not just with nature, but with the creator of nature. Yeah. What do you love to do in nature? Uh, be quiet um, and, <laughs> and just like listen. Yeah. You know, just, just go through my thoughts, like just go on walks and just take it in. Like just birds, so cardinals, hawks, eagles. Yeah. Just watch them in all their majesty. And uh, the cardinals were going critters. off this morning. Yeah. I love it. <whistles> they were my, just, it was they're my great. faves. It's more like a <whistles> something like that. Mm-hmm. Really, I love the cardinals the way they call. And I haven't seen a cardinal for years. So. I mean, I've seen them, but like to be here as spring is dawning and the birds are calling and it's just, it, there's an electricity. Yeah. And I'll just say one more word about this. In Australia, there are a lot of birds, a lot of great birds, by the way, um, a few more than in the United States by volume. But one of the interesting things about the U.S. that I had forgotten how awesome it was until I was away from it is you have these very well-defined seasonal migration patterns here, mm-hmm. right? In Australia... Yes, you do have you know the wet season and the dry season, and you do get some regional migrations, and a few species will go up into Papua New Guinea and South Asia. But for the most part, birds stay kind of where they're at. You don't have anywhere near these like giant migration pathways and and uh, patterns where right now it's like the whole continent is waking up. <laughs> it's amazing to hear the birds and see the ducks, and oh, I'm I'm just giddy. I'm giddy about it. I can't wait. You're, you're, you're nerding out. I'm totally, I'm, I'm nerding out. Okay. Bird nerding. Um, so then she goes in, she quotes Psalm 92, a long passage from Isaiah 40 and Isaiah 41, and Isaiah 45. 45. Oh, I love this. I, do, I love what she does after she quotes it. Yeah, she's a, this is the message written in nature. Yeah, so when she says, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my just claim is passed over by my God, like, why are you implying that God doesn't care about you? Mm. And then the response is, the creator doesn't faint. He's not weary, but it says that everyone else does. Even the youth are weary, but he's not. Mm. And that he increases strength. He's with you. He's your God. He will strengthen you. He will help you. He will uphold you and look to me and be saved. And then she says this. Everything that we just said. This, this is, is the message, the message written in nature. You underline the same thing I which did. Which the Sabbath is appointed to keep in memory. Yes. The Sabbath should be reminding you of God's all power, all readiness, all availableness. Like every bit of the Sabbath should be reminding us of this very thing. Great the accessibility point. and the desire of God to be accessible. To not just be near his people, but to help them, to strengthen them, to lift them, yeah. to minister to them, and to save them. No, that was great. Yeah. That, that really jumped out at me too. She's saying... When you take a walk in nature, when you climb that mountain, when you hike through that valley, when you fish up that stream, these are the things you should be thinking about. She literally gives you, this is how you should think about nature and nature's God. And she goes to my, I think this is true, my very favorite passage in the Old Testament is Isaiah 40. Oh, that's my, I, my whole Bible for Isaiah 40 is just an underlying. It's just, it just underlined the whole thing. It's like John Madden got a hold of my Bible. Like this is... <laughs> Yeah, it's all... You know what's funny? I have said, D, yeah, that if I... Thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. If, if I had to preach every sermon for the rest of my life from Isaiah 40, you could do that. Yeah. It wouldn't even be difficult. Like, for, you could do that. If I could get a little bit of grace and do 37 through, like, 61... Oh, well, yeah, that's like the whole glorious but, vision. But, yeah. but as far as Isaiah goes, Isaiah chapter 40 is incredible. And I love the fact that she quotes here extensively from Isaiah 40. And then she says... This is the message written in nature. And in the Sabbath itself, like that's what it's meant to teach us. I'd never, Mm. I'd forgotten the fact that she makes this bridge here. It's not just that God is so awesome and wants to encourage us with these life-giving words. Like 
the Sabbath is supposed to give you that reminder That's right. of these passionate pleas and, and invitations of God. I, I was thinking to myself, it would be a good idea to periodically read this chapter early on a Sabbath morning just to remind yourself mm. of what your frame of mind is supposed to be on Sabbath. I, I would agree, absolutely. I have said many times before, and I really like this idea, that I don't keep Sabbath, it keeps me. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that the Sabbath keeps us, that the tender fatherly hand of God keeps us is to have our mind in the right place because as we're going to see, simply abstaining from work is not necessarily keeping the Sabbath. Right. You can be abstaining from work and breaking the Sabbath. She'll make that point later. She's gonna make that point. Yeah. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, top of page 323, this is 283 of the original, she, she says uh, the Sabbath was not for Israel merely, but for the world. So if you just take out that whole center section, here's what she's saying. The Sabbath was for the world. Yeah. That's what she's saying. Jesus will say the same thing when he says the Sabbath was made for man, anthropos, mm -hmm. right? For mankind. Okay, somebody was trying to call us and we told them no. We'll talk to you later, whoever you are. <laughs> um, then uh, another reference to the creator's power. I did my little circle with the dot symbol several times in this chapter, probably eight, eight or nine, where she talks about the Sabbath as a sign of the creative power, the power and love, the power of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that's a consistent theme here in this chapter. And she says it here again, the Sabbath will continue as a sign of the creator's power. And what Ellen White does here. I really like the posture that she takes here because too often as a Sabbath keeper myself, and you're a Sabbath keeper, Sabbath keepers can be, and I don't wanna be misunderstood here and I, I don't wanna be offensive, but Sabbath keepers can be a little insecure. Hmm. And what I mean by that is when we meet a follower of Jesus, a Christian, a sincere disciple of Christ who's not keeping Sabbath, we feel like we have to go into defense mode yeah. and justify our position. Apologize. Apo yeah. Exactly, and, and we, we get very passionate about what I call the continuity of the Sabbath, like proving, demonstrating from Scripture, as Ellen White is here doing, that from creation to the new creation, right, for that whole period, that in fact the Sabbath is uninterrupted. It's for the world. It's for mankind. It was not a uniquely Jewish institution. Yes to all of that, and Ellen White does a good job of it. But I want to say that I think the stronger argument and I think the more persuasive approach on the Sabbath is not to talk so much about the continuity, not that that's unimportant, but to talk more about the content. Yeah. It, okay, okay. The why. So here's some, exactly. Not the okay, way, okay, the so I'm convinced I, I should be keeping it. What's the benefit? What do I get? So yes, continuity, but double yes to content. And what I like is Ellen White does spend a little time on the continuity here, like three paragraphs, yeah. and then she spends the rest of the chapter on, so this is what the Sabbath is about. What this the is the why, is this is the essence. Yeah. And what is not. Yeah, she's, of course, yeah. because against the backdrop of the first century religious right. context, it was like Jesus had to disentangle mm -hmm. what the religious leaders had turned the Sabbath into. And so if you're a Sabbath keeper and you have family members, friends, associates, neighbors that are not Sabbath keepers, but they are followers of Jesus, do not immediately jump in your insecurity, in your desire to defend and show that you're right. Don't jump to continuity to make your persuasive biblical argument, start with content. Start with how the Sabbath is a blessing, why the Sabbath is a blessing, what you do on the Sabbath. And another great way to say this is, don't lead with obligation, lead with opportunity, right? Like, oh, we're obliged to keep the Sabbath. Okay, fair enough. It is one of God's 10 commandments, but the Sabbath is more than an obligation. Just like marriage, marriage is more than an obligation, right? In my marital, marital obligation to my wife, I don't primarily think of that relationship in terms of obligation. I think in terms of opportunity, the opportunity to love and be loved. And so if you're a Sabbath keeper, I just want to, I just want to encourage you, think content over continuity, not that continuity is unimportant, and think opportunity over obligation, yeah. not that obligation is unimportant, but okay, so what? What's so great about the Sabbath? And that's a lot of what this chapter is about. And the privilege of it. And she closes with that too. The privilege of the Sabbath. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what you opened up there with right. was the Tonstead thing about how this isn't just about, hey, I'm powerful. You need to recognize me. God's saying, I want to be with you. Yeah. But what a privilege. Yeah. Um, one more thing I want to point out. Okay, moving down to the next paragraph here. 
That first sentence is dynamite. Well, read it, read it. She to says, us. No other institution which was committed to the Jews tended so fully, and this I think is a really important word. She says, to distinguish Great them word. from surrounding nations, as did the Sabbath. And God designed that its observance should again designate them as his worshipers. And it was a token of their separation mm. from idolatry. So she keeps using these words to kind of draw out this point of the privilege that they had that others didn't. Yeah, that's right. That's, this, the fact that they did this and had the privilege of it is what set them apart. And that it from idolatry and their connection with the true God. Again, that kind of distinction. Yep. But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men themselves must be holy. They need yeah. to be different. Not just the day that they keep it was different. It should make them different. They should be different. Yeah. And through faith, then they could become partakers of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. We talked about that today with your students, how a great many people don't know the word holy at its most sort of basic core means other or to be different or unusual. And so when the Sabbath was set apart as holy, it was set apart as a different day. When God's nation Israel was set apart as holy, they were different. When we are set apart for a holy purpose, we're set apart for a different, a peculiar, idiosyncratic purpose. The Sabbath is a different day. And I really noted what you noted there, the importance of these words, distinguish, designate, separation. His worshipers. Yes. And then idolatry versus the true God. Yeah. But it wasn't, it wasn't elitist, as we've already seen. No. The Sabbath was made for the world, right? But there are idolaters in the world and in the context of a world in which not everybody is a worshiper of the one true God. When we behave in this way that's holy, that's different, that's peculiar, it should generate some quizzical interest, curiosity. Hey, why do you do what you do? And the answer is, well, because... God is awesome. Something better is the idea that comes to mind. Mm. And, and Moses makes this point multiple times in Deuteronomy in like 5, 8, and 10, around that, or 4, 5, and 10, where he has this idea that what other nation has the privilege yeah. that you and I have. Yeah, you're right. And, and he uses two things together that are synonymous, the presence of God and the law of God. Yeah. That, that we have the privilege of having this powerful law and that God is amongst us. And he lumps the two things together. And the ironic thing is, the, the aspect of the law that makes that the most clear of God being with his people and the law is the Sabbath. The Sabbath. And so he, he implies that there's a privilege. No other nations have the privilege that you have, and it should be something that would be you know viewed as something better. How she talks about where Jesus didn't disparage Jacob's well, he offered something better. Better. Uh, I think the same idea is what he's drawing out here, not that idea of arrogance, but the idea that they have something better to offer than what these people are running to, the futility of their false idols. Yeah, and it turned into, and she's gonna get into this, it turned in not the offering of something better for everybody, but it, be, it became a point of basically religious bigotry. This like, is what makes me better than you. Exactly, yeah. the end, she actually is gonna say this, the, the, the thing okay. that was supposed to be an end, that was supposed to be a means to an end became an end in itself. Yeah, and she's gonna talk about that. End. That's right. Um, she does say there on that in that, paragraph that you were just reading from through faith they become partakers of the righteousness of christ very next paragraph as the jews departed from god and failed to make the righteousness of christ their own by faith that's one of those little threads that she's mm -hmm. clearly pulling from the last chapter the righteousness of christ by faith by grace alone through or by grace alone through faith alone to the glory of god alone right so like she's pulling that chapter in last chapter and saying yes righteousness by faith Yes, the righteousness of Christ. And the Sabbath is an illustration of that. It's the, it's the crowning weekly reminder of that reality. His creative yeah. and redemptive power. Yeah, yeah very, and his, very And his good. sanctifying power. That he's the one that keeps us. She yeah. then does the power. She then gets into some of what we were just talking about, how the religious leaders had, she uses the word here, surrounded God's rest day with burdensome requirements that she says reflected the character of selfish and arbitrary men the word arbitrary there, D, to me, is so important. Yeah. The Sabbath is not arbitrary. It is not capricious. It is not without rhyme or reason. The Sabbath is inbuilt to the very nature of creation itself. God created in six, rested on the seventh. He then invites us into that rest. It's not an arbitrary rule like you say to maybe, you know, your children or something, you know, you're trying to find something for them to do. Okay, pick up that pile of rocks and then carry that pile of rocks and set it down here after they've carried that pile of rocks. What, Dad, what do we do now? What, okay, pick up that pile of rocks and move it back. And do it because I said so. And do it because I said so. This would yeah. be arbitrary. Arbitrary, it would be capricious. It would be cruel. 
And, and she closes that paragraph on this page by saying it would make them look upon God as, as a, tyrant. a tyrant. Yeah. And that's exactly, if you just said, if you did this kind of thing with your children or with some population over which you had control, like you're a prison guard or you're a slave owner or whatever, you know, in the ancient world, like with uh, Pharaoh, do this because I say so and I have power. People are going to say, yeah, no. and the Sabbath, apart from creation, is kind of weird. Like it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like you don't, nothing happens on the Sabbath that makes you think, oh, this day feels different. No, like if you drank a glass of water every day of the week, it would, no, it's a glass of water. The air feels the same. The address is the same. The sky is the same. There's nothing that obviously distinguishes the Sabbath that sets it apart. You don't just go. So it does feel a little strange until you see that the Sabbath is, and Ellen White uses the word embodied in the law, embodied in creation itself. And so it's not arbitrary. God is inviting us to participate with him in rest on the day that memorializes his creative power. And she makes this point that as the Jews, in that same paragraph, as the Jews departed from God and mm. failed to make the righteousness of Christ their own by faith, then the Sabbath lost its, its significance to them. Yeah, that's right. She kind of has this cause and effect thing and that Satan worked so hard to do that because he knew that it was a sign of the power of Christ, to go back to your earlier point. Yeah. Yeah. The, the thing that was supposed to be a means to an end became the end. Next page, she then says, um, she caused uh, the, the religious observers, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, caused them to think that the observance of the Sabbath, as was required, um, made, uh, she says, it made men hard-hearted and cruel. Hard-hearted and cruel. Yesterday, one of the things that we talked about was in the way that the religious leaders and others like them that were sympathetic to them were relating to the tax collectors, the outcasts, and the others, she says their heart contracted. Their heart became brittle and contracted and shrunk. And the way that they were relating to the Sabbath, which was, again, this incredible memorial of God's creative power and love, she says it was actually hard-hearted and cruel. Mm. Cruel. Can you imagine? repurposing the very thing of God that's designed to show his glory, his approachability, his love, his imminence, and turning it into an object of cruelty. I mean, it's, it's satanic. It was hijacked, it absolutely. It was hijacked. And I love the very next statement. I double underline this one. She says, it was the work of Christ to clear away these misperceptions or these misconceptions. And, yeah, that's right. Um, I really, really value that she's making that clear. And she goes in on this. And this isn't the only place where she does this on the topic of the Sabbath, but she just makes it abundantly clear. Like You mean in the Desire yeah. of Ages? And, and you get the vibe from reading her writings, regard because we talked about this uh, offline, that like you get the vibe when you're reading her that she just so... She's like the sweet savage who in, <laughs> in, in, like goes in on the abuse yeah. of religion. Yeah. And how this is... Not, and you just like... Ever since I read The Desire of Ages, I, I read the Gospels totally differently. I see Jesus with this continual like face palm scenario of like, you guys are missing the point. Right. Like you literally have missed the entire point. And this is what he's trying to do is remind people what the whole thing is about. And I'll, I'll hold one of my points until we get to a later paragraph well, where he says that. I love what you say there, Dee, because I was sitting in this chair just over here and Dee was sitting right there and he was quietly reading and I, and I was quietly reading because we'd finished teaching this morning and then we had lunch and we came here to get ready. And he's just sitting in his chair and his dog's running around like a crazy person, <laughs> a crazy dog. And then he just says, D just says, ooh, she's a sweet savage. <laughs> and I just started laughing. I was like, you have to say that on the video. <laughs> you have to, say, it's because it's true. Ellen White goes in hard on these misrepresentations and misconceptions of who and what God is. Good for her. Jesus did the same. And we should do the same, right? Like when we see God being misrepresented or his purposes being repurposed for cruel and nefarious and hard-hearted outcomes, we should be like, no. In fact, at one point in here, she's actually gonna say Jesus was angry. Yeah. She says it. Jesus was angry yeah. because the thing that he'd created for a holy and happy purpose was being repurposed for cruel and hard-hearted outcomes and he was angry about it. Yeah, they aren't just missing the point. They're misusing the whole yeah, thing right. to hurt people. So the very thing that was not meant, ignorance, the very thing that was meant to relieve suffering, caused caused suffering. suffering. Yeah, and she alludes to that and how Satan was using it earlier. But that's what he did. One of the things that another thread we pulled that little righteousness by faith thread through in a couple of paragraphs ago. Here's another little thread that comes from last chapter. Um, she says, although the rabbis followed him with merciless hostility, which mm -hmm. I thought was an interesting phrase. Yeah. He did not even appear 
to conform to their requirements. I love this. But went straight forward, keeping the Sabbath according to the law of God. This is now the third chapter in a row where Ellen White has made the point expressly that Jesus was not a politician. He was not orienting his compass to what people would perceive or like or what would ingratiate him to the hearts of people. He, I love that, he went straight forward. What does God want? I preached a sermon years ago at GYC where I put two words together, the word God and the word audience. Godians, and when we that. live for the Godians, we're living for an audience of one and we just let the chips fall where they may. Now that doesn't mean we're socially obnoxious or unsociable or unapproachable. What it means is, is that Jesus had de de decided that he was going to serve God first and foremost and then just let everything else line up as let it the, did. And I thought, fall where they may. Yeah. she's pulling that through. That Jesus, when he attended Matthew's party, he knew, in fact, I'm gonna come to this in just a little bit. He knew how that would be perceived. He didn't care. He just went forward. He went straight forward. And we should do the same. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I just wrote down here that it was quite funny. She's now describing the story in Matthew chapter 12 where the disciples harvest the grain and she says that it was a kind of threshing and a kind of harvesting and reaping. And I just thought, funny, you know, how petty. And, and they, they would chalk that up as a double offense. Like yeah, she says a double whammy, yeah, so the, double offense. So the Pharisees are looking for like as many ways to add citations to people that right. they can. Like, oh no, you didn't just get it wrong. You actually got it double wrong. Double wrong, like two citations. You're so busy looking at what people aren't doing that you have no idea what you should be doing. Yeah. And that's, again, missing the whole point. Yeah, you're exactly right. She says a double offense. Um, then, okay, so they approach and say, hey, look, your disciples are doing, this is Matthew chapter 12, your disciples are doing what's not lawful, and Jesus goes, I love what he does here. Yeah. He goes big time and reminds them that even though they were familiar with many of the rabbinical, uh, rabbinical um, traditions and also quite familiar with some of the details of scripture, they had missed, as she says in the last paragraph, how did she, or the last chapter, she says they were wholly ignorant of its spirit. Mm. And here, remember, Jesus has already done this in John chapter four when he's come to uh, Nazareth and they say, hey, isn't this the carpenter's son? And then Jesus goes to their own text and says, yeah, in the days of Elisha, there were lots of lepers, but God healed a non-Jewish leper. Yeah. And what was the other illustration that he gave uh, here? It was... Um... Uh, the Naaman. Naaman. The oh, yeah. I, I confused the two. Yeah. So in the days of Naaman and then in the days of the widow of Zarephath, That's there right. were many widows and he was, so, and they hated that. It yeah. says that they brought him out to the top of a hill and they were gonna throw him off. So Jesus has showed again, as you might remember when Ty Gibson was with us, a mastery, a mastery of the Old Testament. He knew those stories inside and out. And so here when Jesus is questioned, he actually meets them on their own ground of Judaism, of Torah, she and says, says you don't know your own text yeah. because if you were going to hold them in contempt for these double citation, double violation, what about David? And what about the priests, right? Because the priests are supposedly doing that which is unlawful. And then David, he must have done what was unlawful when he in what, 1 Samuel chapter 21, went into the sanctuary and ate the showbread that was only for the priests. And so, do you need to go sort him out? And so, what he's saying here is by the standard that you're holding my disciples to, you would have to condemn the greatest of your kings. Yeah. Like David. If you follow that line of logic, you're going to have to indict some of your biggest heroes. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And he shows his familiarity, mastery of scripture and their basic unfamiliarity with scripture. Because what happens to the brain, not only does the heart contract, but the brain contracts when you, not literally contracts, but, but the mind is a better way to say it, contracts. When you start mingling together the truth of God, the word of God, with all of these man-made requirements and senseless rules and traditions, and you can't differentiate between what's what. And Jesus says, hey, have you not forgotten what scripture says? And reminds them of 1 Samuel chapter 21. And they got nothing to say. And just imagine, like, this is your job. Like, imagine some <laughs> guy, some uneducated Great you know, point. coming in here and telling you, by the way, you have no idea what you're doing. All those degrees on the wall are worthless because you don't even understand what you're reading. Yeah. Like, it's so offensive. Like, but the thing is, like, the way that he does it is, it's kind of how we talked about in the, in the At Capernaum chapter. Like, he says it was so much power and authority that they really couldn't argue with him because yeah. they, like, he made such a clear linear argument of their mishandling of the things that they thought they knew. Yeah, really well said. 
Um, okay, next page, 325 of the types and symbols, 286. And what jumped out to me here was that three times Ellen White, and actually if you count the next page, four, five times, five times, in about three paragraphs, she uses the phrase, the object, hmm. the object. I'll just read them to you here. She says that uh, their labor was in harmony with the object of the Sabbath. Next paragraph, it says the object of God's work in this world is the redemption of man. Next paragraph, she says, he declared that in their blindness, they had mistaken the object of the Sabbath. Next page, uh, top of page 326, 286, their object was to direct men to the Savior, talking about the sacrifices and all of the symbols and forms. And then finally, one more right at the end of that same paragraph. But when the mind was absorbed with wearisome rites, the object of the Sabbath was thwarted its mere outward observance was a mockery. And so I thought this is great. She just goes in hard five times in like three paragraphs and says, the object of the Sabbath, the object of the Sabbath, the object of the Sabbath. And for her, it's to show that God wants to be with man, both in terms of creation and in terms of redemption. Yeah. And that object had been lost sight of. That purpose, God's inbuilt purpose of the Sabbath had been lost sight of because it had been, her words, barricaded and surrounded by senseless man-made rules and traditions. Which is why they were so quick to judge the disciples. Like, because they, they missed the entire point. Like, you're, you're offending the, the boundaries that we have drawn. Mm. Yeah. They, and like, I, I've talked about this before with, with other people that like, once they got all these whoopings in the Old Testament for not keeping the law of God, they realized every time we break the law, we get a whooping. So their idea was, why don't we build a wall around the law to ensure that nobody touches it. And no more whoopings. So, yeah, no more whoopings, because no one likes getting whoopings. And so at the end of the day, what they did is they lost access to the actual meaning of the law, because now they're focused on the outside boundaries oh, instead of the principles point, of the law Dave. within it. Yeah, because they didn't want the sort of Babylonian captivity. They didn't want the you know anything like that to happen again. And so they so surrounded Torah and the Sabbath in particular with these man-made regulations that they actually never got access to the thing they had as so, it was intended. They had so little faith in their faith that the only way we could actually even come close to obeying is by inventing all these legalistic rules to keep us from even getting to the law to violate it. But what they didn't realize was they're now violating that law in even greater principle. Whoa, she says that. Yeah. It's interesting that you'd use the word legalistic there because two times in the last chapter she says a legal religion, a legal religion. God is not a lawyer, right? Right. He's, we don't approach God in the same way that we would approach a lawyer. He's a father and a friend, right? I love that idea. Um, I've heard it said that legalism is not the raising of the standard. It's actually the lowering of the standard so that man can reach so it. So that man can actually yeah. do it, yeah. I just want to go back to one of those, the object of the Sabbath. This is page 325, and I don't know if you were with us yesterday or if you read through yesterday's chapter. This should have absolutely popped to you. It's the paragraph that begins, Jesus did not let the matter pass. I'm just gonna read that paragraph. Jesus did not let the matter pass without administering a rebuke to his enemies. He declared that in their blindness, they had mistaken the object of the Sabbath. He said, and then he here quotes from Hosea 6, 6, Micah 6, 6 to 8. Mm. If you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Remember I said yesterday, this is not the last time Jesus will say this. Right. This is a go-to chorus for Jesus. It's a go-to refrain she continues, there are many heartless, heartless rites. rites. Ouch, ouch. Yesterday, contracted hearts. Today, heartless rites could not supply the lack of that truthful integrity and tender love. Contrast those two. I underline them both. Heartless rites with tender love. Jesus is interacting with people out of tender love. The religious leaders are interacting on the basis of heartless rites. And in fairness, Many of them were sincere, Absolutely. but they were sincerely misled. Absolutely. They were sincerely mistaken, right? So in their desire for, in their zeal for the integrity of the Sabbath, the sanctity of the Sabbath, the holiness of the Sabbath, again, they were violating the Sabbath and they created rites and rituals that were actually heartless. Yeah, and I, when I hear the paragraph preceding this one and this one here and what we've been talking about in the last few moments, it reminds me of what he says in the Beatitudes, like, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. Yeah. And he keeps having to say these types of things even after the Sermon on the Mount. Like, mm. you're talking about the Sabbath and that being a big deal. Like, you, you've you heard it was said that you shouldn't do this and this, but you don't even understand what you're doing. She'll allude to this in a moment. Like, you're thinking murderous thoughts on the Sabbath, for goodness sakes. 
Like you're trying to kill me and hate my guts. Oh yeah, she's gonna get there. And yeah, so I right. think that, that this idea of you've heard it was said, but I say to you, that theme continues well past the Sermon on the Mount of just you and don't that's get tomorrow's it. chapter. Yeah. It's I think it's the it's the longest or the second longest chapter in the whole desire of ages, tomorrow. The Sermon on the Mount. Um, then she says at the bottom of that page there, uh, page 325, 286, she says that again, Christ reiterated the truth that the sacrifices were in and of themselves. They possessed no value. They were a means, not an end. And I just wrote again and again, because we've come, this would be at least the sixth or seventh time that we've mentioned that expressly, that the purpose of the Sabbath, the purpose of the sacrifices and of the sanctuary were always to point, to signify, to alert us to a greater truth and when Jesus came, the shadow met the substance and the thing signified had arrived, right? Right. But they were still clinging to the signifier right. rather than the thing signified and they missed it. Yeah. They absolutely missed it. Anything more there? I'm on the next page. Um, it just, this reminds me of Galatians 3.24, the fact that the law was to point us to Jesus yeah. who is the embodiment uh, and who's the power source for the law to even become a reality in our lives, like it says in Romans 8.4. So then she also describes him here at the, we're on page 326. She, I mean, she, she just is, roasts in the rest of this paragraph. Yeah, wearisome rights. Yeah. So here like, she says, heartless rights. Here she says, wearisome rights. I mean, you just have the sense that when Ellen White is writing about this, she has her thesaurus there and she's just like, okay, what else can I say? How else can I say How this? How else can I say this? What other blistering language right. can I use? <laughs> blistering, great word. So it's the service of love that God values. This is the top of page 326 in Types and Symbols or 286. Um, it's the service of love that God values. And when that is lacking, the mere round of ceremony is an offense to him. And Ooh. then she says, so, so with, with the, the Sabbath. Sabbath. So it was, Ouch. it was designed to bring men into communion with God. But when the mind was absorbed with wearisome rites, then the object of the Sabbath was thwarted and its mere outward observance was a mockery. It's a an mockery. offense and a mockery. And I just like, what an indictment to modern day Sabbath keepers. Like if we don't understand the yeah. why of Sabbath, yeah, 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 yeah. but we're only making sure that we're on the when of Sabbath, we could be engaging in mockery and offensive worship and be totally oblivious to it. Because at least yeah. I showed up, at least I wore the right yeah. clothes, yeah. but we can be just as guilty as them yeah. in doing the same thing. That's why we've got to stick to content. Yes, continuity is important, but stick to content. What is the Sabbath about? What's the why of the Sabbath? Stick to opportunity even more than obligation. The obligation will figure itself out. If I'm in love with my wife, I will more than fulfill all of my husbandly responsibilities and duties. But if I concentrate on the obligation part, then I'm like a C student or a C minus student, just trying to get that minimal grade yeah. to sneak through. But when I'm coming from the position of love or the posture of love, well, when I think about opportunity, obligation takes care of itself. Yeah, you'd rather do above and beyond than the bare minimum. Yeah, because because the motivation is love, not it's love, not legalism. Right. Right. Like, what's the minimum I have to do here to sneak through? The Sabbath is not about the minimum, you know, rabbinical Torah-based requirements so that you can still be in good standing with God. You can't be in good standing with God apart from the righteousness of Christ. That's completely by faith, as we've talked about already. Yeah, it's super Babylonian and pagan in nature that if I just do the things that keep dad from getting angry, there's going to be peace without recognizing that this gift was an invitation to communion with dad who Whoa. isn't angry. Like he's, he's inviting you to commune with him because he loves you. Beautiful. So this idea that just do the stuff to make them happy, throw the, throw the virgin in the volcano and yeah. on the seventh day and then we'll be good and I can go back to doing me for a week and calm yeah. him down. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how it's... It's a part of human nature. I mean, this is a consistent theme. She actually says this. This is a theme in all false religions. The assuaging or the placating of the angry or annoyed deity. And that's a feature of basically all false religions, which is what makes the gospel so unique and wonderful, is that God is not being assuaged. He's not being placated by some gift or some devotional act that we bring, some sacrifice that we make. God himself does not require supreme sacrifice. He makes yeah, supreme he sacrifice. Is. And I think that's why true religion is so offensive to our human nature. Yes. Because I, I want to have some ownership. I want to be able to buy my Talked ticket. Talked about this yesterday. And I, at the same time, like I, I don't want to be told what to do. I want to do me. She, yeah. she literally says exactly that. I've just got to read this to you because you just said it. 
Listen to this. They trust in self. This is on page 317. I read this yesterday. They trust in self and depend on their own wisdom and do not realize their spiritual poverty. They insist on being saved in some way by which they may perform some important work. When they see there is no way of weaving into self, self into the work, they reject the salvation provided. I mean, come on. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Okay, here's another, here's another little uh, strand. This is a really cool one. So I want you to follow me on this. The next paragraph, I'm back on page 326, begins upon another Sabbath. She tells the story. Jesus goes into the synagogue. He sees the man with the withered hand. This is so cool. She uses the very same language. I'm on to Ellen White, man. I'm, I'm on to her in, in a certain way. She uses these little literary devices. And I'm I on to you, lady. I want to show you one here. It's so great. She says, the Pharisees watched him, eager to see what he would do. Now, she uses this phrase, the, the Savior, Savior well knew. Check that phrase, the Savior well knew. I understand now, that too. Yeah, but look back on page 310, 310 of types and symbols, 274, 275 of the original. Listen to this. So this is when Matthew throws his party and invite, remember Matthew with all the outcasts and all the you know, unsavory types, invites the party and says, Jesus, will you come? And look at what, I'm just gonna read it here. He well knew mm. this would give offense. What does she say wow. here? The yeah. Savior well knew. So that's phrase number one. And that he would be regarded as a transgressor. He'd be regarded as a transgressor the same way there. He'd be regarded as hanging out with the right. wrong kinds of people. But watch where she goes next. The Savior well knew that in healing on the Sabbath, he would be regarded as a transgressor, but he did not hesitate. Look at this. Tell me I didn't find something here. He well knew that this would give offense. Look at what she says here. The entertainment was given in honor of Jesus and he did not hesitate to mm -hmm. accept. Both times she uses the same phrase. Wow. He knew that this would be offensive. He still didn't hesitate. He knew it and didn't stop. He walked straight forward. He had no problem moving through and past and over these, what does she say, heartless rites and man-made ceremonies that had been obstructing and obfuscating the great truth of who God was as communicated in the Sabbath. And that's such a practical wow. encouragement and indictment to us because we feel that tension. Like we know that some people who don't understand how things are supposed to be, they're going to be upset by this. And yeah. There, and there's that tension and there's that hesitancy in us, but he blows through that stop sign he does it in a most tactful and powerful way, obviously. Great word, tactful. But my point is just the fact that it's it's a reminder to us that when you feel that tension, just because there's tension, that doesn't mean that you have to, to give in to it. Mm. Um, of this idea of, of, of that you need to hesitate because like people may misunderstand me, but if Jesus took that position, what hope would we have? Yeah, fair point. Like there's a lot of tension Jesus had to deal with and mm -hmm. Jesus chose to keep it moving. He chose to keep his eye, he, he set his face like a flint, we're told. Yeah. And, and it's just a, an encouragement to us in that. I just thought that was so cool. He knew how this was going yeah. to be perceived and he still didn't hesitate. He's not a politician, he's a man of principle, yeah. immovable principle. And Here's another one, just one more example if I could. Go, you go you and then i that sentence? Well, what I was gonna say is there's another little, ex oh, no, I'm on the next paragraph. All right, well, I'm gonna finish, finish that, that sentence. This is so good. But he did not hesitate to break down the wall of traditional requirements that barricaded the Sabbath. Yeah, that's the word. And so just the, the importance here that Jesus was, was intentionally, intentionally and militantly tearing down unnecessary boundaries and barriers. Yeah, um, yes. The way that he did this. So here's another really good example, a thread from last chapter into this chapter. She says here that when Jesus asks the question, is it lawful, I'm reading it here, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or evil, to save life or to kill? She actually says here that Jesus met the rabbis on their own ground because they had, she says, a maxim that a failure to do good when one had opportunity was to do evil, to neglect to save life was to kill. Well, she did this very same thing. She described this very same thing that Jesus did in the Matthew feast because when the people said, why does your master eat with these mm -hmm. kinds of people? He, he, he addressed them on their own ground because they believed that the, sin, uh, that the sinners, that the Gentiles, that the Republicans and others, I almost said Republicans, I didn't mean that, the publicans. She says, very interesting, she says that, that they regarded them as sick. Yeah. The religious leaders regarded them as sick, as having an illness. And so Jesus meets them on their own ground and says, by your own standard, these people are unwell. You regard yourselves as healthy. I'm not sent to the healthy. I'm sent to the sick. I'm sent to those that fill their need. And so I just love the idea that Jesus meets people on their own ground. I've said it before. They're playing checkers. They're playing tic-tac-toe. He's playing 4D chess. 
He, did he that, meets them on their own ground. He did that with the souls he longed to reach, and he also did it with his enemies. Well, yeah, we made that point a couple days yeah. ago, how Jesus wanted, you know, the old saying, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Like Jesus wanted even the religious leaders and those that were antagonistic to him as close as possible because he knew that was their only chance. Yeah, but just like this approach of meeting people on their own ground. Yes. Like he, he spoke language that ministered to people where they were, but he also went right at the lines of logic that the Pharisees cherished yeah. to help them recognize. Like, I'll meet you where you are, but you're not gonna want me to do this. Yeah, you're not gonna like gonna the way this like. goes. I mean, just yeah. think of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus when we get there. Jesus is, it's, it's now known yeah. It has been demonstrated that Jesus took an already existing parable that was in circulation. There's two of those that he did. The story about the, the all the people that worked in the field, some worked an hour, some worked two, some worked three, yeah. some worked six, and they all got paid the same. That is actually, Jesus has taken and purposefully changed that parable. But that was a rabbinical parable in the mm. days of Jesus. He grabbed that parable, repurposed it, and changed some of the major... Mm. Because the way the parable was told in the days of Jesus, and I'll get to this eventually, was the idea that, that one was better and was specially rewarded by the landowner, by the king. Jesus tells the parable, and everybody's paid the same. Everybody's treated the same. Took the same parable. Same with the rich man and Lazarus. He took them on their own ground. There was a rich man. He fared sumptuously every day. There was a poor beggar at the gate. He, and he reverses it. Hmm. So Jesus is taking the language of the day, the illustrations in nature and in agriculture of the day. He's meeting them on their own ground and he's just at every, he's just outflanking them at every turn. Not to win an argument, but to win a soul. Yeah. Not to win an argument, but to win a soul. Because if he can show them, there's, a, there's an argument here, it's actually called reductio ad absurdum. If you can show the absurdity of an argument, then the argument falls apart on its face. And Jesus reduces many of their arguments to, to absurdity. And, and they should respond and say, hey, you're right. You're, but they just become further and further hardened. Not all of them, but many of them continue to tr contract inside of their own heart. And they just, <clears throat> in fact, she actually goes on to say here and the, the gospels say, they just finally said, okay, we gotta kill this guy. We gotta, we gotta get rid of this guy. This guy is trouble. I think it's important to note that when we talked about Jesus blowing through these, these stop signs or this tension, he doesn't hesitate, it's because of what you just said, his desire for the souls of these people. Yeah. Because it can be really easy when we've encountered you know, bigotry and abuse from religion that we wanna retaliate and use the same spirit that they did, but using inspired texts or our righteous indignation to say, you shouldn't do this, this is bad religion and blah, 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 blah. But the point is that we can be prone in our human flesh to respond in the same way that they do Agree. with better arguments. Agree. But that wasn't what Jesus was doing here. We can't use what Jesus did as empowering us to fulfill our yes. desire of the flesh. Yeah, oh, that we thank had, you. We had to be careful with thank that. Thank you for that, saying that. That, that. Jesus only did this to win the souls of these people. He had to break through the fog. He had to break through the hardness of their hearts yes. to then sow these seeds. And I think that's so, so yes. important for us. I'm so glad you said this, Dee, because... He was also uniquely, the Bible says about Jesus, that he knew what was in man. He didn't need anyone right. to tell him. He knew what was in man. Jesus was uniquely qualified to issue these rebukes. Right. It doesn't mean that we can't, in the right circumstances, in right. the right situation, with the right spirit and the right heart, also administer a rebuke. Right. But too often, we're not in it in the same way that Jesus is in it. He was uniquely qualified as God, right, and as possessing full exhaustive knowledge of the plight of the human condition to administer rebukes in situationally appropriate ways. And Sabria, just a little bit ago, she said he was trying to win their hearts. Yeah. And Jesus is going to try everything. Remember when he healed the leper and said, go tell the priest, she says that was an olive branch to yeah. try and say, hey, look, I respect at some significant level, the validity of your priestly office. When he paid the temple tax. When he fish. paid the temple tax. Yeah. And then eventually when, when it escalated and all else has failed in Matthew 23, he's just gonna take the gloves off <laughs> and he's just gonna go in. But he's right. trying everything. Yeah, so it's, it, it should be the zeal for a soul and, and the prayerful surrender that leads to those types of confront, confrontations. Right, yeah. What, what were the two things? Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, the surrender and <laughs> the, the surrender of the soul, the, the desire for the soul and, and a prayerful surrender yeah. beforehand. To not react emotionally in the heat of battle. In the heat of it. But to, if the, the very reason why I'm speaking right now is for the soul of this person, for the protection of other souls who are being hurt by this yeah. person, and 
You're doing it prayerfully and tactfully before you get into it. Yeah. She then does this thing that I thought was really, really cool. And mm -hmm. I guess I'd had this thought before. Are you oh yeah, we shouldn't miss that. Point that out before I get there, because I was going all the way down here. Um, but they kept silent. Like when Jesus got them cornered, they did they like a cornered animal, they didn't lash back, they just go quiet. There's another place where they say, I think he's talking about us. And you remember what they about with the, yeah, yeah, I do, I do. I think he's or, how about when the disciples come and say, hey, did you know that the Pharisees were offended when you said that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Like, Jesus is like, you don't say, right? <laughs> A little late to the party, fellas. Um, but when he had looked around at them with anger, but again, the, it, she identifies the source of his anger yeah. being grieved at the hardness of their hearts. Correct. Then he says what he says, just stretch out your hand and just do it anyway. You're healed. Yeah. I have said this before and I stand by it. I am so thankful that we have a God that is capable of being angry. Yeah. What, where, where would we be without an angry God? A God who wasn't angry at oppression, yeah. injustice, rape, right. religious perversity, right? Abuse. We need a God who is angry at those things. And here, the anger is directed primarily at the outcome and the effect. He still has... And God is able to keep this tension. Yeah. This is what you were talking about a moment ago. God can be angry at the thing and still have complete unreserved love for the individual. We, that, that line gets messy for us pretty easily because when somebody has wronged us and we're wrong, we're angry at the thing, we can then decide we don't like the person either. Mm -hmm. But Jesus, that wasn't Jesus. No. He could walk that tightrope, that line. Yeah, and that, that's where we can rest in his righteous indignation and his justice at the end of the day. Like, and, and to, to prayerfully weigh out and meter out ours, but he can go yeah. He can go full strength. We need to kind of be tempered and, and surrendered in that. Deb yeah. Snyder says that he did not sin in his anger, and that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. he definitely did not sin, but there is a way to be indignant, right? Indignation, yeah. angry, in a righteous way, and uh, great point. And I love the name that she uses for the people that the are coming to scope out Jesus, the spies. I love this section and here, by the way. they dare not answer, yeah. She, when, I really like this here. I thought this was great textual exposition where when Jesus says, okay, okay, let's play that game. Which one of you having an animal that falls into a ditch wouldn't pull it out? And I've thought to myself, oh yeah, now that makes sense. That's a good argument. But Ellen White goes on another level here yeah. that I was like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And here's her basic argument. If somebody possesses an animal of some kind that got stuck in a ditch or stuck in a you know, mud bog and had to be pulled out on the Sabbath, here's what she says. She says, because Jesus says, which of you having, right, pointing at them. And the reason she says is that the animal, she calls it a brute, which I thought was interesting. Right. The animal is valuable to the owner. Follow the line of reasoning here. It's great. Uh, she's, yeah. so it's basically selfishness. That yeah. is a commodity. Hey, if I lose that goat, if I lose that cow, if I lose that animal, I lose value. I lose an asset. So then that raises the question, well then who are these assets? Right, with the withered hand right. and the man, the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda, who owns them? That's Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is literally taking a thing, and by the way, their keeping of the Sabbath, this is very interesting, their keeping of the Sabbath by pulling out the animal was not because all the animal, animal will be suffering on Sabbath, it, it was selfish. It was basically financial investment and Jesus makes this great point. He's like, look, when you're keeping Sabbath, you're only really furthering, you know, or I should say attenuating, uh, you know, financial loss. But what I'm doing is I'm saving people. Yeah, and, and it, it shows how distorted their view of the Sabbath was because it was a day again that communicates the value of man. And this is what makes Jesus' argument so brilliant is the fact that you do not value man. You value a dumb animal more than you value a human being. And this day was meant to communicate their value, to restore their value in their own eyes and to relieve their suffering. Yeah. And you would be more inclined to relieve the suffering of a brute animal than you would yes. of a child of God. I remember Nathan doing a sermon on this while we were at I house. remember that, that too. Truly I human cannot sermon. believe you said that. I, I love that sermon called Truly Human. I cannot believe you said that. Sometime I was in, thinking about the Nathan Renner sermon on this. And the fact that, you know, when we make people work for us on Sabbath, we treat them worse than worse. God intended. I we treat livestock. Yeah. D, I am gobsmacked right now. Yeah. I've got to pick my jaw up off the ground because yeah. I literally had that Nathan Did, Renner sermon in my mind when I, I was saying. I was going to write Truly Human right here with Nathan's sermon. Yeah. That is such a God thing. Yeah, It's amazing the things that lodge in your mind, isn't it? I never forgot that. Yeah, oh, man. Dude, he's a spirit-filled man. I, I miss him. So, I love that man. And So I think what, what 
One of you my keep no going. I got to get my drink. All right, you can close the windows too if you're freezing. No, I'm fine. I got to um, grab my water. But the I think that the Sabbath is meant to elevate our estimation of man. It's one of the points that's being pointed out here. Yes. Not just that the Sabbath communicates our value, but that the Sabbath should elevate our estimation of man. Because she says they originate in man's desire to exalt himself above God. <gasps> you're on the next page. I, I'm sorry. Oh, I got a great idea. Well, no, keep going. Keep well, going. Let keep me going. rewind though. So the spies didn't answer. This is the last page on 326 of Types and Symbols. Uh, the bottom 286. of 286. It says, The spies dared not answer Christ in the presence of the multitude for fear of involving themselves in difficulty. They start difficulty all the time, but when they're cornered... <laughs> now, let, let's, let's, let's not have a fight here. We don't yeah, want to talk point. about this. They knew that he had spoken the truth, and rather than violate their traditions, they would leave a man to suffer while they would relieve a brute because of the loss to the owner if it were neglected. That's right. The greater care was shown for a dumb animal than for a man who was made in the image of God... This illustrates the working of all false religions. Yeah, that's right. And so they originate in man's desire to exalt himself above God, but if they result in degrading man below the brute. So every religion that wars against the sovereignty of God defrauds man of the glory or dignity which was his at the creation and which is to be restored to him in Christ. Whoa. Every false religion teaches its adherents to be careless of human needs, sufferings, and rights, but the gospel places a high value upon humanity Amen. as the purchase of the blood of Christ, and it teaches a tender regard for the wants and, and woes. woes of man. Yeah. So the needs that people have and, and the challenges that they have. And so she says that the gospel does this, but I wrote in my margin, so does the Sabbath. The Sabbath that's exactly is right. To speak into that's that the space. whole point. It, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know if any of our observers know this or our listeners know this. This is an incredible insight. The first time that the word Sabbath is ever, the first time that the word Torah is ever used in the Book of Exodus. Did you know this? Mm -mm. I'm going to show you the coolest thing right now. The very first time that Torah is used in Exodus. Make a note of this. I'm just literally pulling this out from the Rolodex. I think it's Exodus 12:49. That's right. Listen to this. First time Torah, the word Torah, which is usually translated law, is found in the entire book of Exodus, which is, of course, the giving of Torah from Sinai. Listen to this. Exodus 12, 49. God speaking to Moses to speak to the people. One Torah shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. The first time Torah is used, and there's this basic idea in sort of theology. Of for the world with the Sabbath that she mentions earlier. Exactly. So the idea is you have what's called the law of first usage or the rule of first usage, which is not always the case, but often the case in scripture when a word is used for the first time, it becomes informative, at least informative and sometimes normative for the way that that will be understood for the rest of its usage. Mm. The first time Torah is used, God says to Moses, one Torah for the native born Jew and for the foreigner that travels among you. Mm. Whoa. Yeah. God's plan in giving the Sabbath. So when he says you... You know, you don't work, your, your family doesn't work, your, even your animals don't work, your employees don't work. This was not a uniquely or proprietarily Jewish institution. Yeah. And this was for the world. And that's fleshed out more in Deuteronomy than in Exodus. That they yeah, may rest because of the, well slave, thing. the yeah, slave thing. That they may rest as well as you. Okay, yeah. I got a couple things I got to say about that paragraph you just read. First of all, there's this incredible Blaise Pascal quote from, from years ago that I read. And I've got it in my computer, but it's in front of me here. But basically, here's what Pascal says. This is what he says about idolatry. French mathematician, philosopher, theologian, incredible. Um, scientist. This is what he says. And I'm, this is a paraphrase of Pascal on idolatry, and she gets it exactly right here. It makes me wonder if she was familiar with the quotation. Pascal says, idolatry teaches people either that we are greater than God or as great as God, mm. or that we are lower than the common beasts. Wow. It, it, Pascal says that is the telltale sign of all idolatry. It either wants to take people all the way up, 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 to be even better and bigger and equal with God, or it says, no, nah, you're just even lower than the beast, the common. Mm. And she says that right here. Yeah. She says that when we engage in idolatry, and one of the reasons that God is so deaf on idolatry in both the Old and the New Testaments, little children, keep yourselves from idols, mm -hmm. is because idolatry is not only an insult to God. Yeah. Idolatry is an, insight, is an insult to human beings. Because what is an idol? An idol is taking and fashioning something making something and saying this thing 
is the image of God. This thing, we made this, we crafted this, and there's this great, you know, in, in Isaiah where God says you go into the woods and you cut down a tree and with half of it you bake right. your bread and the other half, you know, you turn it into a totem or an idol. And I always say, I hope you, you know, I hope you burn, burn the right hand. half. Yeah. But, but here's the thing. This is a very important point. God has already imaged himself on earth. And he didn't image himself in wood or stone or metal. He imaged himself in flesh and bone. And so idolatry is not only insulting to God, it's insulting to us. We are the image bearers of Yahweh. I just, and she makes this point here. She says it's degrading, which by the way, degrading to man. In the last uh, last chapter that we were in, she talks about how Jesus upheld the common dignity of every man. There's yeah. another little thread. I, feel, I think that word dignity is what's under attack. I think that the language is so helpful. Idolatry yeah. attacks yeah. the dignity of men. Yeah. The, the, the dignity of mankind. Yeah. And it reduces God, of course, to sure. you know, just some regional proprietary deity. But, but the one true God, this is why Moses was, God was emphatic with Moses on Sinai's summit. He said, you didn't see any form. You saw nothing. Right. Nothing that you could make, a shape, an image, a crack, which is why it's so amazing when Jesus says to the religious leaders of his day, you you have neither seen his form nor heard his voice. They knew they hadn't seen the form of God, but when Jesus says, neither of you heard his voice, they're like, what, what? They had Torah, but they had... They had not been hearing the voice of God. And what I love is that Jesus eventually confesses to be that image because if you've seen me, you've, yeah, seen, you've seen the Father, the, Father, the yeah. one who's in the there's bosom. Only, there's only one image you're going to see, and it's me. I just love what you read there, Dee. The gospel places a high value upon humanity. Um, and then, you know, Jesus basically confronts them on their yeah. own grounds. He says, here's the thing. You're accusing me of breaking the Sabbath, but I'm actually saving life. You're planning to kill. This is a subtle yeah. dig. A little bit later, he will say to them, you're planning to kill me. And then they're saying, no, we're not planning to kill you. Of course, he knew. You're filled with the demon. You're fi- exactly. Who's trying to kill you. Yeah. But I just wrote here in the margin of my Desire of Ages, I wrote, is the Sabbath a day for murder or mercy, mm. for slaying or saving? And she uses wordplay here because she says they were hunting his life. Yes, hunting. While he was saving life and bringing happiness to multitudes. Don't miss that. I'm yeah. so glad Dee pointed that out. There's a purposeful play on life. They were on words. There's, they were hunting his life. While he was saving life. While he was saving life. And bringing happiness. Okay, yeah. so there's, there's a purposeful. She's, she's a great writer. <sighs> what a um, so then we go. I'm on the last page here. Uh, let me see if I got anything. I, I, I'm on the last two pages. Uh, I'm going to do this, the next paragraph under what we just read, um, the second to last paragraph on 327 in Types and Symbols or 287. Because she says, In the healing of the withered hand, Jesus condemned the custom of the Jews and left the fourth commandment standing as God had given it. So it remains in its integrity, but it's redefined to where it used to be, not what they did to it. They, you know, yeah. mangled it. Um, kind of like, you know, the idea that something was mangled in the potter's hand but repurposed for something good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, she says, um, it is lawful to do on the Sabbath, he declared. Then she says, by sweeping away the senseless restrictions of the Jews. Mm. Um, Christ honored the Sabbath while those who complained of him were actually dishonoring God's holy day. And then she says in the next paragraph that giving a modern day application that those who hold that Christ abolished the law teach that he broke Sabbath and justified his disciples in doing the same. I've heard that. I've heard um, that argument before. And it reminded me of the point that, that, um, that Nathan actually made. Um, Maybe, no, it was a convocation a couple years ago about the idea of John chapter 5 and the word uh, that's used for Jesus broke the Sabbath. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah There's yeah. the word lua, which means to loose or to untie. And it's the only time it's translated that way in the New Testament. Everywhere else that word lua is used, it, it's for that, to loose or untie, not to break. And it's just a mistranslation. So it's a poor translation. And, and the point of that being that this is what Ella White was saying throughout this whole chapter, that Jesus was loosing or unrestricting or freeing or liberating the Sabbath from the burdensome obligations that the Pharisees had put on it. So they wanted to kill Jesus for that. Mm. Like they wanted to kill Jesus for setting the Sabbath free is the point that's being said in John chapter And when we get to, is it Luke 10 or Luke 13, where Jesus, it's Luke 13, right? Where Jesus heals the woman, this, ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham. Is that Luke 13? It's 13 or 14. So it's, if if it's, if it's a teen, it's 13. We're not there yet, but yeah, Luke 13, beginning in verse 10. So when Jesus looses the woman, 
he's also trying to loose the Sabbath from their senseless restrictions. Yeah. Again, here, Jesus performing some of his high profile healings purposely and provocatively on the Sabbath to try and startle them out of their, as she calls it in the last chapter, their rut. She uses a great phrase where she talks about how they were in a, a rut of ceremonies and traditions, mm -hmm. fixed in a rut of ceremonies and traditions. Um, okay, I'm on the last page. Second to the last page. Okay, second yeah. to the last page. I just thought this was really great. I just wrote, this is a cool way of saying this. These priceless gems had been placed in a false setting. Their precious light had been made to minister to error. God desired them to be removed from their settings of error and replaced in the framework of truth. This work only a divine hand could accomplish. And By that, that, all that language is very visually um, similar to William Miller's dream. Yeah, the of dream. That, that casket with the jewels, it's all torn apart, and it has to be, you know, an angel comes in with a dust broom yeah. and rearranges things. It took... Um, it has that same being, imagery to it. Yeah. Bottom of that page, she again uses okay. the word comfort, I which that? I liked. Yeah, do it. Just as she says, by its right after that, she says that by its connection with error, the truth had been serving the cause of the enemy of God and man. Wow. So truth was still involved in causing harm to God and man because it was mangled or mingled with error. Mangled and mingled. Yeah, and so Christ had come to place it where it would glorify God and the work of salvation of humanity. And then the next paragraph, there's the, she quotes, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The NLT has that. this amazing translation. She says that- Oh, yeah, 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 um, yeah, 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 yeah. The NLT has from Mark 2.27 that the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people the requirements of Sabbath. And then That's she, a great way to translate that. And so the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people the requirements of the Sabbath. That's the NLT from Mark 2.27. And then she says basically the same thing after that. The institutions that God had established are for the benefit of mankind. And then she uses quotes that all things are for your sake. For your sake. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the point that Jesus is making, is that I made the Sabbath to be a blessing and a benefit to mankind. I didn't like make up a day and say, oh, I should probably find somebody to keep this old day. It wasn't like iPad parenting, like just go over there and keep yourself busy. Keep Don't yourself busy while I'm you know, monitoring the universe. <laughs> yeah. um, then the last two paragraphs, yep, last two paragraphs, yeah. she uses one, two, three, four times his power, a sign of Christ's power, a sign of Christ's creative and redeeming power, evidence of his mighty power, um, and then I love the fact that she closes on Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. I think that's the perfect place to close it. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will Sabbath you. Yeah. I will give you rest. And there are commentators on the gospel of Matthew that say that the whole pinnacle of the gospel of Matthew in terms of its thematic development is, is that section there, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. So the, the essence, the punchline of Matthew's gospel is, Come to me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You will find rest for your souls. Jesus is basically saying, come to me and I will Sabbath you. Mm -hmm. I will Sabbath you. That's exactly what Jesus did in creation. It's what he did in redemption. Jesus Sabbaths us. He gives us rest. Rest in who we are, rest in who he is. Rest from the tyranny of modernity and of idolatry. We rest in Jesus, in God, and in his goodness. And he says, come to me, I'll Sabbath you. And she makes that point in the, the preceding paragraph towards the end where she says, then the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to make us holy, and it's given to all whom Christ makes holy. So it's not that you need to do this in order for you to be holy. It's Christ's gift in making people holy. Like it, it's, a, it's a response he gives to yeah. us as a sign, and it was given to all. Uh, again, she says that twice. And then the bottom paragraph, to all receive the Sabbath as a sign of Christ's creative and redeeming power, it will be a delight. It's not burdensome. Seeing Christ in it, they delight themselves in him. And so this is kind of a charge and a call to us when presenting the Sabbath to people to ensure that people actually see Jesus in it. This isn't about math or correcting calendars. The whole mm. purpose of this is showing why. And when people understand the why, the when makes sense. We're not Great. just asking people to exchange idols, right? From one day to another day. Like we want people yeah. to see the true purpose of what's going on here. And so while it calls to mind the lost peace of Eden, it tells of peace restored through the Savior. Yeah. That yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, this yeah. means of restoration. She actually has this great line on that where she's, when she's describing the, um, I want to read this. I just thought this was so great. 
because you just ended in Eden, Eden restored. Listen to this. This is back on page 323, right at the beginning when she's in that section on the continuity of the Sabbath. I just thought this was so beautiful. And when Eden shall bloom on earth again, God's holy rest day will be honored by all beneath the sun. Mm. That's great. Okay, let's do our rubric. It. Let's do our rubric and then we'll wrap this up. Do our words. Uh, D, um, yeah, D, what was your word? What was your word? Who I kind of wrestled because um, at the beginning of the chapter, I... By the way, what was your word there, Christian yeah. Martin? Great to see you, Christian. The Sabbath is a celebration that he fills us with who he is. Amen. Uh, if you've got some words on there, let us see what your words are. I wrestled with this one a little bit too. I've got it down to two. Yeah. Same. And uh, so while we're doing... Okay, somebody said token. Great word. I, I had like designation or separation as like my first thought when I was first reading the chapter. Like it, it showed God's people as being different. And rest, life differently. rest. Um, but I ended up... Sign. I ended up choosing... Um, connection. Ooh, good word. Rest, says Sean. Rich says connection. Christina says gem, free, sign. Uh, Gay Main says sign. Deb says blessing. Brady says delight. S Pop V says how. Oh, what did you have, Hannah? Rest, love, restore. That's good. Hip City Girl says commune. Lisa Burnett says remember. Dream C11 says sign. Pablo Kindle says redemption. Kathy uh, says restore. Five Carson so five says gift. Uh, Karen says rest. Allison says communion. Jane says communion. Your future doc says rest. Solo Scriptura says sign. Your future doc also says gift. Uh, I don't know what that name is. Chai 4NG2 says restoration. Laura says celebration, peace, gift. Katerski says delight. Whoa, you had seven words, Hannah? It's supposed to be a word. This isn't the days of the week, sister. Not the days of the week, girl. Holy service. Okay, what do you got? A lot of great words in there. I was going to say restoration just because I felt it encapsulated everything. It was restoring the Sabbath to its original meaning and the Sabbath's ability to restore man. Yeah. So I would say restoration was probably going to be my final choice. Nobody, I mean, mine's a little weird. It's a little out there, but, you know, you've come to, come to expect this from me. <laughs> So my word, I didn't see anybody else say it. Hannah saying, yes, I know. Come on, sister, seven. That's a bit excessive, don't you think? <laughs> so my word, as I hope you like it. It's a little cheesy. You're already apologizing. No, I'm not apologizing. I'm just setting it up. The I like words that have, that have a double meaning, and I've done this a couple times before. One of my favorites was when we looked at the word... Um, control in the At Capernaum mm -hmm. chapter. Remember that, that, that we render control and then Jesus was always in control. I actually forgot the day you were there to say my word. Yeah, that's true. I forgot and I'm letting you know right now. So it was that, that, that the whole idea of who's in control and control and we yield control and Jesus was in control of these very difficult, tense situations in which he found himself. So I like to play on words. So my word for today is object. Object and it's because that five times she says the object of God's work, the object of the Sabbath, the object of the Sabbath, the object was to direct men to the Savior, and the object was the Sabbath. And I also really like, and this is the kind of slight play on words, it might be a little cheesy, but I still like it. The people objected, same spelling, different verb now, right? Objected to Jesus' keeping of the Sabbath, and he then objected to their perversion of the Sabbath. And so I like the fact that I get two words with one spelling, O-B-J-E-C-T, the I'm, object and the objection. So I'm going with object. That's cheating, but I think you get out on a technicality. I do so get out on a technicality, you. but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with we'll ask object. The judges. We'll consult the judges. Yeah, what do you guys think? Does it pass? <laughs> um, at least it's not Hannah's seven words, okay? That's She's like throwing every word in the dictionary out there. Okay, um, let's just quickly go down our rubric here. The point... For me, the point was to demonstrate biblically the content and the continuity of the Sabbath as a sign of God's love and power. I think the point was, I would agree with that. I think what I kind of had for my point was that Jesus was intentionally un... Jesus was sweeping away the, the misnomers of the Sabbath and what it was about um, and 
speaking clearly that this is a day of relieving burdens, of communicating value, and uplifting our fellow man. Okay. So the point was to remove the faulty foundation of Sabbath and to restore it to its glory. Okay, that's really good. That's what, that goes along with your word, restoration. Right. Yeah. Okay, and then how about number two? What do we learn about the person of God? He is deeply interested in the burdens and cares of his people. Uh, the, mm. the Sabbath is, is, Jesus is all about getting in and uplifting people in, in the context of Sabbath, relieving burdens yeah. and so forth. Agree. I will come to me and I will Sabbath you. Right. right? I will give you rest. Yeah. Um, the thing that I wrote down for the person was that God is not arbitrary and his commands are not artificial or contrived. That the commands of God are rooted in the nature of things. The Sabbath command is rooted in the nature of creation and the nature of God's um, purposeful, intentional creating in a certain pattern, resting on a certain day, passing on to us the legacy of the Sabbath. What we don't want is a God who's just making up stuff and saying, yeah, carry those rocks and do that. That's not what we want. We don't want some arbitrary, capricious contrivance. We want a God that makes sense, that appeals. And Jesus again and again is appealing to people's thinking, to their reasoning. You say, and I just love the fact that God meets us like Isaiah 118. Come now, come sit down, sit down at the table. Let's talk this out. Let's reason together. And so... I wrote that God is not arbitrary and his commands are not artificial or in any way contrived. Yeah. Okay, how do we pray this chapter, Dee? What do you got? Um, that I would not just preach sermons and give Bible studies on the why of Sabbath, that I would learn how to live the why of Sabbath. God, help me to learn how to live this in a practical way. Yeah. To every Sabbath, remember what this thing is really about and that my time would, would reflect that. Very similar to mine. I wrote... Um, God, teach me how to keep the Sabbath and to be kept by it. Yeah. And I think that's a very important concept, that the yeah. Sabbath keeps it us. It keeps us. I agree. Right? The holy Sabbath keeps a holy people. She actually makes that point. Yeah. Um, and then the practice is very similar for me. I wrote to keep the Sabbath in spirit and in truth. That is to serve, bless, serve, bless, and heal others, and to generally increase happiness. Yeah, increase. She like says that. that. Yeah. Uh, for me, like it's it's that reminder because many times we are we are working our guts out six days a week to re- to prove to ourselves and to God and to our boss and to our family that we're enough. But, but the Sabbath is our reminder that you're already enough. Um, and so I think in practice of, of learning Thank you, Jesus. To, to pump the brakes and to remind ourselves that I'm already loved, I'm already good enough, I'm already accepted in God's eyes. So in practice, to just like really let Sabbath remind me of that so that that keeps me through those other six days of the week. Oh, that's great. So I'm not running myself crazy to try to prove I'm something, to yeah. rest in the fact that I'm already something, not just on Sabbath. Extremely well said. That's literally exactly what I mean when I say that the Sabbath is not just something I keep. It's something that keeps me. Yeah. By the way, I said earlier that tomorrow's chapter was the Sermon on the Mount. That's not true. Tomorrow's chapter is He Ordained 12, which is on the call of the disciples. Then the Sermon on the Mount. Dina, you'll be with us tomorrow right. on Tuesday. But on Wednesday, the only way we could do this, I think, would be as if we did it early in the morning. So we'll have to see if yeah. we're up for that. Okay. We'll have to figure that out. Okay, we'll let you know tomorrow what the plan is for Wednesday. We hope you have enjoyed this study on the Sabbath. If you're a Sabbath keeper, our invitation to you and our charge to you is to embrace the way that Sabbath is being described here in the Gospels and in this chapter. It's incredible. It's beautiful. Let's be honest. It's attractive. Yes. It's absolutely attractive. And too often, the way that we present the Sabbath to others who are not Sabbath keepers is as unattractive. Yeah. It's like a requirement, a, a, a ritual. No, no, I'm not interested. So again, we have to make the emphasis on, this is my strong conviction, on content over continuity, and an opportunity over obligation. How did you say it? The why instead of the win. Yeah, and I think... You mean by to win the argument? No, 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 the the what day of the week. Most of our arguments on when... when Oh, when, you're saying when. W-H-E-N. The why over the when. I thought you were saying win. Because most most of our arguments and presentations are the Sabbath is the seventh day. People want to see Buddy. All right, they want to see the Sabbath on the seventh... We we prove the seventh day as opposed to why God gave it. That's a far more compelling and, I think, attractive argument than just what day of the week it is. Agree, agree. Totally but agree. Whenever day it is, we'll go as long as we see that that truth. So I'll go grab this, grab grab this, this little monkey. grab this monkey here. So hey, you t- got... tell them about your fancy water bottle there. Oh, I got to tell you guys something really funny in closing. 
Um, okay, let's see this dog. Bring this dog. Can you lift that dog up? It's not oh, too big. He's only 80 pounds, so sure. It's my, uh, my exercise hey, come here. for the day. Hey, come here. Come on. Come on. Come here. Break all the bad house habits. Look at this guy. Say hi to everybody. Look at this guy. <laughs> Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Oh, dear. He loves to play tug of, what is this? Tug thing? of war, yeah. Tug of war with this thing. <laughs> hey, buddy. Say hello. Say hi to everybody. Yeah. And he just wants to get Any Uncle, ideas? Uncle David kisses. How do you feel about the keeping of the Sabbath, buddy? Oh, I love it. Yeah? Do you feel good about it? I think it's a special Sabbath cookie. <laughs> Really? You give him a Sabbath cookie? It's like a really big cookie right. compared to the one he gets during the week. Beautiful dog. Very fun, actually. How old is he? He's He will be two years, July 3rd. So he's a little puppy. Um, okay, hey, let's pray. And uh, Oh, yeah, I was going to show you my walk. Okay, this is a funny story. Very quickly. I stopped into Whole Foods, as I mentioned yesterday. Bad idea to go into Whole Foods when you're hungry. And uh, I, I got this water that's called Liquid Death. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this, it's like the melting face skull, liquid death, sparkling water, and then the little byline is murder your thirst. <laughs> so it's actually quite good. It's just, there's nothing in it. It looks like an energy drink or something like rock star energy drink. I've never had one of those. Yeah. I've never tasted, I wouldn't know what a Red Bull tastes like. It or tastes a, like battery acid. It's pretty yeah, terrible. I've never had one, yeah. but... Liquid death, it's actually from Austria, from the Austrian Alps. Anyway, I thought that was kind of, I was drinking this today in front of the class and they were like, what are you drinking? And I'm like, oh yeah, I, I guess I should realize I don't want to be a stumbling block. <laughs> oh, just drinking a high energy alcoholic beverage. No, it's just regular old water. Um, D, you had opening prayer, didn't you? I did. Okay, so I'll have closing. Father in heaven, what a great chapter and what a great time to spend with our little DA with DA community. Father, wow, we want to keep Sabbath and be kept by it. Yes. Father, you are the saving, creating, restoring, rescuing, time-spending God. Father, rescue us from idolatry. Rescue us from those systems of thought that would cause us to exalt ourselves as equal to or above the creator and also would then absolutely remove us of our dignity and place us below the level of the animals. Father, we are made in your image, created for a purpose, created by an incredible, loving, and kind heavenly Father. Mm. Father, that gives us so much dignity, so much purpose, a sense of who we are, where yes. we are, and why we are. Mm -hmm. And Father, the Sabbath is a weekly reminder of that. Not something that we learned 10 years ago or two years ago, and now we occasion, no, every week we are reminded in this great Sabbath rhythm that you are God and we aren't, mm -hmm. that you are God and we are made in your image. And Father, I wanna pray especially for those here that have maybe had a negative experience with Sabbath, for whom Sabbath has been maybe in their home, maybe in their churches, maybe in their cultural context, just regulations, just mm -hmm. senseless, heartless rites, as she said, Father, I pray that they would be able to feel the beauty, the beauty, tender love of the Sabbath, the beautiful, tender love of the Sabbath that you lavish upon us every week, every day, but especially on that Sabbath day. May we rest in you and may you reveal yourself increasingly and wonderfully to us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. We'll be back tomorrow at about the same time for chapter 30. Right? Chapter 30, He Ordained 12. God bless you all. Have a great evening. We'll see you tomorrow.